51 to Zach. One. We get one, the build one. Marquise, what's up, man? Let's get the show started, man. Let's go! Black the Beast. For years I tried to be cautious. I tried to be compassionate. I tried to tell myself it was just gonna come to me. But now I know I gotta go out and get it. You know what I mean? Hey, first of all, I'm from me being a young man. It's what I love to do. You know, 10 years old, I was listening to Wu Tang Clan and everything. You know, um, everybody, Nas, Jay Z, I grew up on that. You know, Easy E. I'm from Harlem, man. You know, I'm from Harlem. When you start seeing people become rich off of it, then it becomes a whole different outlook. Like you have a whole different insight of, all right, now this is really, this is real. This is about, this is about money. I'm just trying to make the bread, man. I'm not a con, I'm not a working nigga. Like I'm, I'm, I'm never will be. A nigga that can wake up and go to a nine to five job. And I'm not trying to say that to discredit people because you know what I'm saying? You got niggas that make millions of dollars doing that. But I just, I just, that never was in me. You know, so I, I'm using this as like plan A is plan B and C and D. Like, you know, so. Seriously, if I wasn't rapping, tell you, early on, I was just, you know, I was in school, I was in college, I was running around just, you know what I'm saying, you know, doing what niggas in college do, so, you know, I wasn't really thinking too much. You seeing niggas come through your hood with all kind of fancy cars and big ass jewelry and just money all over the place, you know what I mean, because I, I grew up, you know, I, I caught uh, at like the era when niggas was really, really, you know what I'm saying, getting money and and really flashing it so I know what it is when Harlem was Harlem. Like now, as children, if you're growing up in Harlem, it's, it's a little more mild because, you know, of gentrification and things like that. But when you when I was younger, it was it was straight up, nigga, crack vials on the corner, you know what I mean? Broken down, abandoned buildings, you know what I'm saying? Everything. You feel me? So somebody gonna lose their life. Older generations used to tell me, yo, when you have a child, it's gonna change for you. You know what I mean? And I'd be like, yeah, all right, cool. You know what I mean? One ear and out the other. But then when you finally do, you're like, yo, these niggas was right. I mean, that's when shit got real. That's when shit got real. You know, when, when I had a daughter, you know, she's six years old now. It was like, this is this is it. Like, I'm a, I'm a man, I gotta provide. I, I need to, you know, make sure her life is set and she can have the, the things that I didn't have the opportunity to grow up enjoying when I was a youngster, you know, so it's, it's all about her. I just do this for my family, make sure everybody good, man, because I'm the most successful one out of anybody in my family ever, so I'm, I'm automatically obligated because I didn't really have morals growing up because I was just able to do whatever I wanted to do, you know, as a youngest. I had to look at you know, other individuals and take from them and be like, all right, this is how you do it. This is the way you go about it. It's all about her. When, when you have a child, you start to see things in a different, in a different light. Upper West Side, you know, my upbringing was pretty diverse. I would be in Brooklyn or I would be, you know, spend a lot of time in Washington Heights, um, you know, downtown, LES, whatever it was, really just New York City was my playground, was my backyard, you know.
Music's been a big part of my life since I was born, pretty much. My whole family is musicians. My pops is a career musician. My mom is a musician and was involved in the music business for a while. As a little kid, we had a recording studio in the crib. My dad was always, you know, going to different sessions, going out to hear music, um, bringing home different kinds of music all the time. So music was like the backdrop of my life pretty much since, since I was born. Um, at that time, we were listening to, you know, Red Hot Chili Peppers and Jimi Hendrix and Marvin Gaye and Bob Marley and Nirvana, Stone Temple Pilots, you know, just, just really listening to everything. As I got older, it was Wu-Tang and Biggie and the Fugees, um, Beastie Boys, Nas, Jay-Z, you know, Eminem. All, all the greats really was, the, you know, that, that's what I was listening to. You know, music is, tends to bridge cultural gaps. And then, you know, I went to public school and went to magnet schools where people from all over the city would go to the same school. Race and economics and all that stuff is always something that fascinates me because it, it affects the world. And for a long time, you know, I struggled with how do I fit in to hip hop, you know what I mean? How, how does my story fit with the narrative that is most common in hip hop? Because hip hop is a, a story of struggle and my particular struggle, my personal struggles or whatever my, you know, my own, you know, your own life journey may be was not necessarily represented. Who I really am inside, so I just put it in a song and let the fans decide. Growing up and going to the battles and stuff, and you know, just rapping whatever it was, you know, this, you know, third base. Vanilla Ice, um, you know, Eminem, Paul Wall, Bubba Sparks, but I think that, you know, in the circle that I really came up in on like an underground level, it was a little more diverse and, um, you know, the race issue may have been less, you know, played down a little bit compared to where you might see it at now. And, um, you know, after a while people just get beyond that and it can be a gift and a curse. You know, you have to be yourself because I'm, I'm somebody that just values honesty and truth and I think that right now in hip-hop you know our palette as far as what stories and what narratives are, are acceptable or what, what we gravitate towards is wider than ever. I think that that's good. Um, me, me being who I am, where I'm from, I think that that's what people fuck with over everything. You know, it's not about being the toughest guy or coming from the same background as somebody else, but it's about, you know, conveying human emotion and human experience in an honest and genuine way.
so long to come back. Cause you know what I'm saying. You know what took me long to come back. Yeah, I mean, man. Let them know though. You know what I mean. The bread. I told niggas like I never said I wouldn't battle again. Like I never said that. That never came on my mouth. Like yo, I wouldn't battle. I said. I'ma only battle if the bread is right, if this amount of money is on the table for a nigga. That's the only time I'ma come back. And you know, shout out to Smack URL. Y'all work some magic. I fuck with that, cause you you know you was like, yo. You gonna make it happen. You gonna make it happen. You said that. You said that. You're like, yo, who we get? yo, trust me. I mean, we single handedly build the industry out of this out of this art form, man. Like, cause, you know, me, my brother Beasley, you know what I'm saying, Chico, we took this our form off the street corners to the barbershops to the parks and now we selling out venues and creating you know what I'm saying revenue so we can actually pay these artists that shit is some real shit to me you know what I mean LeBron James called me the king that's it off of battle rap <laughs> LeBron James yeah. knew who a nigga was you know what I'm saying that's, that's, Puff that's know real. who a nigga is that's you know what I'm saying Jay Z know who a nigga is my nigga they like, ain't no strangers to this you yeah. know what I'm saying shout out to the big homie Diddy you know, like he hosted the first battle, every captured on the smack. Ladies and gentlemen, check it out. Check it out. Whenever you whenever you want to get a, a real motherfucking junk, when you get a, wanna get it judged the real way, you come here and get it judged the real way. I'm the way. one with the dope and one with the scope. Cross so big like I run with the Pope. Tatiana, that's my daughter I raised. Smoke a quarter of haze. Dog, I push more water than waves. It's a thousand to you, but to me it's a couple of bucks. Hey yo, big, am I trouble or what? Uh-huh. I swear they ain't never hit me. <laughs> He comes from this shit, you know what I'm saying? Jay Z come from this shit, DMX come from this shit. I know y'all seen the t pool table battle. You know, I mean, Freeway, Cassidy, like Swiss. You know what I mean? This is this is this is this is like the pure essence of hip-hop like you know what i mean you had to have a battle like one time or another in your career if you consider yourself a rapper man you know we just put it and made a sport out of this shit and now you know what i'm saying the url has evolved into like you know what i'm saying an ultimate rap league a league where you know what i'm saying mcs go up against each other and they do their thing fans everybody want to know man after this battle will we see murder move in a ring again you can answer that <laughs> I don't know, man. I see these niggas, man. You can ask. I come to Harlem. These niggas got, you know what I'm saying? Drop top Mozzie, drop top Benz, and Beamers, all that. These, these, they playing hard in Harlem, man. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know if I can keep up with them, but you know what I mean? We're going to see what's up, though. You can answer that. Like like I said. <laughs>
lost a battle. It was no Twitter. It was no fucking Facebook. It was none of that. But I guarantee you, some rap niggas in the Bronx knew that you lost. You know what I'm saying? That same day, like niggas, if you lost bad, some niggas in the Bronx, like yo, I heard your man just got smoked. Niggas will see you, it's like shame, like you know what I'm saying? <laughs> For real? A B is for niggas that, that like flowing. And no no disrespect to Freeway, you know what I'm saying? But that is why Freeway wanted to put the beat on when he battled Cassidy. Even no to a beat, Freeway sound better, you know what I'm saying? And he know he could have used all of them different flows and then it would have, Cassidy, would, his flow wouldn't have been like how Freeways was, you know what I mean? But niggas don't rap on beats, nigga. Like, you know what I'm saying? Niggas wanna hear what you got to say. Say something hot. So I don't even know I have any pressure. And this is not being funny at all. Niggas that battle me, they don't really have pressure because like, if they lose, it's like, you lost. Niggas be taking moral victories. That's what, that's what they do. You in a lose-lose every time. Every time. Solomon just gotta come in there and just rap and, and try to stay close. I need niggas to walk away like, yo, that nigga Mook? That's what I need. I, I can't have nothing else other than that. But Myrtle Mook, man, I wish you luck, bro. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, wish August that nigga 19th, luck. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Summer Madness 2. You know what I'm saying? We're gonna see what it is. Return of the Legends. You already know. Right. We in a building. building. <laughs> You know, when I was a little kid, I used to play guitar and write raps and, you know, I wanted to be Slash and, you know, play all the crazy guitar solos. Pretty early on, my pops brought home a copy of Straight Outta Compton, N.W.A. And for me, the way that um, Dre was combining, like, the soul music with some rock sounds with the drum mach machines and the drum breaks and the whole collage. I gravitated towards that because I could in you can incorporate every every genre and I was always growing up around every kind of music so I wanted to do something that would be able to be a melting pot for all those influences. They know I'm at a level that they never could attain, never, never could attain, so they mention uh, in the name. Mama's babies living largely, acting crazy in the party. I go shopping or Rodeo and them places never charge me being lazy. Show up tardy, burning haze and sipping 40s every night. A different city, every day a different shorty. When I go that time, that digital underground, nice and smooth. Rock him, burn me, rock him. And at the same time, listening to, you know, Red Hot Chili Peppers and Jimi Hendrix and Marvin Gaye. Just, just really listening to everything. In between us is 150 miles, so I'm spinning circles round them, but they dumb it. As I got older, it was Wu Tang and Biggie and the Fugees, um, Beastie Boys, Nas, Jay Z, you know, Eminem, all, all the greats really was the, you know, that, that's what I was listening to. Pull up. So this is my little pre-production setup. Um, a lot of ideas come together here, you know. I make my own beats, to do everything from scratch, do some sampling, you know, a little bit of um, playing keys and playing a little guitar. You see, we got the, you know, we got the hi hat and all that, the live drums. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna give you guys a little advanced preview of something that I cooked up, you know, produced by me. Everything, just you know, me, start start to finish. Here we go. So now I'm pumping Marvin Gaye, Marley and Hendrix tools, Guns N' Roses, Pearl Jam, Nirvana, Chili Peppers too. Kind of I met DMC backstage at the EO Dub end of the week anniversary. I think it was a 10 year anniversary maybe. Um, and he had already been familiar with me. And he said that his son was a fan. And that when he watched me, he felt the vibe that he used to get watching the guys that he grew up listening to. And I mean, there's no better compliment. There's no, there's nothing that anybody can really say to you that can reassure you or reaffirm that you know you're on the right path. Than to have DMC tell you that what you're doing is something that echoes what inspired him to do what he does. Because so many people have been inspired by him. I ran into Jay Z by La Esquina. It was actually the night that he premiered um, DOA. And if you remember on the blogs, there was audio of him calling from the restaurant. And 
out front of that restaurant. Um, he was in the Maybach listening to a song on Hot 97 when it premiered it. And um, I was with my man Isaiah, and we, we saw, saw the Maybach, and obviously were, you know, entranced by it, wondering who was in it. And at, at a certain point, we saw the door open to the side, and it, and it was Jay. And you know, I, I always say I'd rather meet somebody as a man than as a fan. So I didn't run up on him or anything like that, but you know, I tried to get him in the um, Vulcan stare and, and see if he would make eye contact and recognize me. And he looked over at us and said, you know, he was like, what's up? And I said, what's up? And he was like, no, what's up? Like, I know who you are, come over here, you know? So I walked over to, to the um, car and I was like, yeah, I know who you are too. <laughs> And then from that point, I just, you know, turned into a fan. Almost all of the rappers in the industry are paying attention to battle rap and they appreciate the lyricism and the, you know, the balls that it takes to step into that arena. For me, the goal and the agenda was always music. Um, battle rap was just a means to that end and it just went way further than I ever expected it would. Um, you know, music is really where my, my passion lies and that's the thing I love, you know, making, making beats, um, writing songs, having the whole thing come together from scratch is incredible. Um, and But even for this battle, my mind wasn't on it, you know, I wasn't thinking about MOOC or thinking about being in the ring at all. And once I got the phone call, you know, I knew it was something I had to do because I knew that the fans wanted to see it. I knew that I had been, you know, throwing little jabs at him. And, it's not right for me to do that and not follow through. But actually this battle kind of reassured me that I will always step back in the ring because this wasn't part of the plan, you know, this wasn't in the cards uh, for move to man up and actually step in the ring. Leading up to this battle, like any battle, um, it's exciting and it's stressful. I think the battle is a lonely place, you know? It's, you know, it's like a pitcher versus somebody who's at bat where all eyes are on you and you gotta you know, show up or you don't. And beyond having to perform, you have somebody that's facing you that's their job is to pick you apart and just destroy you. And you're the only one, not your team, you know, there's no teammates. You're the only one that has to live with the outcome of those. Events. Right after the coin flips, there's a tension in the air before those first rhymes that, you know, every moment, every piece of energy that you've had in the months, days, weeks, whatever it is, leading up to that battle, they're on the verge of being where they were designed to be at. And, you know, you just, I just get butterflies even talking about it, even thinking about it. So I think that anytime that there's an opponent or a situation that makes sense the way that this one makes sense, that I will step back in the ring because, you know, I owe that to the fans and, you know, who doesn't want to see their favorite artist battle I mean, when they think that they're that dope. I'm going up against this guy, Murder Mook, or Mook now, now that he dropped a murder. He's Iron Solomon, you know, he's a, um, he's a white guy. He wears glasses. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what I mean? He comes from, what does he come from? Third base, Vanilla Ice, um, you know, Eminem, Paul Wall, Bubba Sparks. It can be a gift and a curse because when you hear me say something that you don't expect me to know about or don't expect me to be able to, to say, it can have a bigger impact, you know, and, and people don't expect it. And anytime you get hit, hit with the unexpected, you know, it just has that much more power, that much more impact. He gonna definitely, you know, say some of his best things he, he, he gotta say. Move the crowd, hold it down, this is the move was scared, move didn't say shit or do shit, and he was there! I don't see him holding up, you know? After the first round, second round is just gonna be like, this is gonna be like punching bag time, for real. Mm. I'm telling you. You know, I've been hearing that a lot, that people are don't think I can go the distance with five rounds, and um, it's just funny to me because the background that I come from before I was doing the acapella battles 
was a tournament battles and I would show up to events that would be two days straight battling and the first day would be 64 MCs. His arrogance is probably his weakest point because he's got that arrogant, you know, Harlem demeanor that obviously is New York to the death, but at the same time, you have to be able to be humble enough to know when it's time for you to improve or work on certain areas, you know? Um, so I think that arrogance can be a weakness. You know? From Harlem, man, it's just nature. You know what I mean? From from a kid who got the best sneakers, who got the best fucking, who could shoot, dribble the best, who could, you know what I'm saying, roll the fucking straw in the gutter, the who shit win, you know what I'm saying? Like for real, like that's that's like how it is, man. This is what I was born to do. Now, tell me if I'm lying to these motherfucking brothers. Immortal Technique smacked the shit out of him in front of his motherfucking mother. And that's what he did when his face met that town. Stood there with the same look he got right now. <laughs> why y'all Harlem niggas is like loud? Like why y'all niggas is flamboyant? Why y'all niggas argue with each other so much? Why y'all? It's because that's that's a niggas blood. You were born like that when you from Harlem, man. It's just nature. Mook is a college kid that raps about street shit. You know, he he's not I'm not particularly buying what he's selling. I don't think I'm the only one that has that has the doubts out. Let's put it that way. I believe he's good at, um, he, <laughs> he's good at, he's a, he's a funny guy, he's funny. Like I said, you know, I don't, I don't want people to underestimate or judge me by the, by the way I look, but Mook, you know, if I had a message for Mook, it's just that I feel sorry for him that he is so blind to who he really is, and, um, I wish him the best, man. I wish him the best. After this battle, it's gone. It's, niggas is just like, yo, leave that nigga alone. Be like, don't e like, leave him alone. Don't even mention that nigga. Be like the type of shit that I'm gonna say. Like, it's, it's not even gonna be a comparison. He's bugging, you know. I mean, that that's obviously delusions of grandeur. All bets are off. There are people on the bottom tier that would shoot this guy a new one. So, for me, I don't really like to talk a lot of shit. I like to just show up and handle business. You know, it's not about me beating my chest and saying I'm the best. It's about me showing up the day of and making it happen. August 19th is gonna be epic, man. It's gonna be, you know, the lineup is incredible. The people in attendance are gonna be incredible. The fan base is more hungry, more educated, more, more avid consumers than ever. And, um, you know, it's gonna be, it's gonna be incredible. I can't really talk too much about him. I just know he's gonna die. Nigga on the 19th is over. <laughs> URL smack, August 19th. Make sure you be in the building to witness his thing. And I'm out of this motherfucker. Easy. So, we outie? 51 is on. One, one, one. Marquise, what's up, man? Let's get the show started, man. Let's go!